cardio is perfect with this audio you better call an audible celebrate this victory win it's so applaudable i don't need the audience here because this is all i know crossover fade away we living in a great time better get your weight up or get ate up at the baseline this will be the jump off started with a jump ball throw the alley up off to my crew now that's a duck ball two points and one you about to foul out free throw all net everybody wow out i can let my game talk you were just a loud mouth we can get the ring with the whole team and then the crowd shout Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Mike Bray Show. I'm Jack Nolan, joined once again by the head coach of the Fighting Irish. And, Mike, another tough week on this very difficult early season schedule where you face two ranked teams in the state of Virginia. You played well at times, but you couldn't break through with a win against a couple of very good teams. Yeah, Jack, I mean, I think a, a kind of a disappointing road trip and – you know, we, uh, we're not the most confident group right now. Uh, as you said, a lot of respect for both Virginia Tech and Virginia. And we had some spurts uh, during both games, but not enough to beat a really good team on the road. Now, at Virginia Tech, you got off to a terrific start. Shot 55% in the first half, hit five threes, led for almost the entire half, had a seven-point halftime lead, but you couldn't maintain that performance in the second half. Loved how we finished the half. We had 42 points at halftime. You're feeling maybe you're into uh, an offensive rhythm that you're going to need uh, to have to, to beat a good team on the road. But start of the second half really hurt us, and turnovers hurt us early in the half where we lost momentum. And then Virginia Tech really got to the backboard, a weakness of ours that you know we have still not been able to correct. And then yesterday, you take on Virginia. Their pack line defense was tough again. You expected it to be that way, but it was the way Virginia shot the ball, hitting 12 threes, including a career-high four from 7-1 center Jay Huff that gave Virginia control of the game. You know, I, I, I thought we'd be better if we backed it up a little bit and not gave up layups because we've given up too much stuff in the paint and – and they really took advantage of us from outside. Um, having said that, you know, we had some really great open looks offensively and we didn't make any of them. And, you know, I, I think, again, because we're not the toughest group in the world mentally because we've not won and we're not real confident. You know, we we kind of carried that over to some defensive uh, possessions where we're maybe feeling sorry for ourselves. So, you know, that's an area where we have to grow and mature. Now, even though you did trail most of the game against Virginia, virtually all of it, there were a couple of particular bright spots. The first is Trey Wirtz. He looks like he's healthy again. He hit some big, tough shots on the way to 13 points, and he also passed out four assists. Yeah, you know, he, we lost them there for a while. Of course, we got him eligible late, then we lost him to an injury. He, he's going to be important to us. And if there's some silver linings out of a tough day, uh, I thought him finding his overall offensive rhythm. He also is a very smart and good defender, which we're searching for on that other end of the floor. Also, Cormac Ryan got into an offensive rhythm and made some shots and felt a little comfortable offensively. And he's been searching for that. And we're going to need that. You know, I felt it would come in time. So, Maybe in a really tough afternoon in Charlottesville, Wirtz and Ryan found themselves offensively, uh, and that is going to be important moving forward. And Cormac was my second bright spot. He had a team-high 16 points all in the second half, and it's really the first time he has looked that way. So you're right. I think that could be a key down the stretch. And, folks, we'll hear from Cormac a little later as he is our player guest on this week's Mike Bray Show. Folks, our friends at NECA want to remind you that they are continuing their efforts to make our community brighter. It's what NECA electrical contractors do every day through donations, volunteer efforts, and by training the next generation of electrical workers through apprenticeship programs. The NECA contractors and electrical workers of Local 153 preparing for a brighter tomorrow. When we come back, we will review Notre Dame's games at Virginia Tech and Virginia in detail, but first this time out on the Mike Bray Show, presented by TireRack.com, the ultimate in contactless tire buying. 
It's time now for our game breakdown brought to you by our friends at Meyer. Mike, your teams have always played well at Castle Coliseum in Blacksburg, and your visit this past Sunday was no different. At one point, your guys were hitting 70% of their shots from the floor and finished the first half of the game at 55%. Uh, we got off to a great start offensively, and you always love to do that on the road, especially against a really good team. You got 42 points with halftime, and you're feeling, God, if you can score in the mid-70s, that may be enough to hold off a really good team but I thought Virginia Tech's defense just totally swarmed us and shut us down in the second half, and, and we had no answers. Now, you did not start Dane Goodwin in this game, but you inserted him into the game just two minutes in, and boy, was he terrific, scoring 10 of his 12 points in the game in the first half. Yeah, I thought, you know, we're just trying to get him going. You know, he had a tough stretch. He's Overall, he's been very good for us. Uh, and so sometimes you just bring a guy off the bench to kind of to jump start him and, and, and it and it helped us in that sense. It worked for us. You took your first six point lead of the game on a three point bucket by Cormac Ryan, followed by a steal and a conventional three point play by Prentice Hub. You were really rolling at this point. Yeah, you know, there's this this team has teased us at times, Jack. You know, we have seen signs of it in a game and signs of it in practice. Again, we have flat out thrown them to the wolves with the schedule against very, very good teams. But for us really to beat anybody, we're going to have to do that closer to 40 minutes, not 20. Now, after those two buckets, Nate Leshesky followed with back-to-back -back buckets, but the Hokies really defended him well. He only got four shots in the first half, and he made three of them. You know, they really switched everything in the second half, especially. That's, uh, you know, where they were really aware of him. But I love what he did. He, he wasn't getting three-point looks. He drove the ball and got to the foul line and found ways to score. And that's the one thing with his improved physical strength. He can get to the basket and take a hit uh, and, and, and can get three-point plays now. He did end up as your leading scorer with 17 points. You also got Trey Wirtz back for this game, a little ahead of schedule, but clearly he wasn't 100% recovered from the ankle sprain. He hit a big three right away, though, to give you another six-point lead at the 1240 mark, and that bucket ended a stretch. You said the, the guys teased you a little bit. You had made eight straight shots at that point. Yeah, we have some offensive firepower at times. We really do, and Trey Wirtz is very important for us moving forward. Again, um, between getting him back for Virginia Tech and him finding his rhythm in the second half, really the whole game against Virginia, I hope we found a confident guard who, who can really help us. Now, I know one of your uh, points to the team before the game was get out guys and run on these guys, and you did. You won fast break points in this game 10-2. Well, I think, you know, when we can get out and get down the floor and not play against any set defense, you know, that, that helps us. But but we have not been able to get enough stops, defensive rebounds and outlets. We end up taking the ball out of bounds too much and we're not able to run as much that way. So that's our challenge the second half of this season. I know one of your hopes for this year was for the veteran Nick Jogo to step up and start playing a regular role in the rotation. He certainly has, and he was in part responsible for a great sequence late in the half. He blocks a shot on the defensive end and then gets a hoop on the other end when he flies through the air to grab an offensive rebound and then throws it in the hoop without touching the ground. He, um, I, I, I'm so pleased, and, and, and we've had a tough year to date, but Nick Jogo – is giving us everything he can give us, understands his role, and he's been a good voice and a leader in a tough time. You know, it's easy to be a captain and a leader when you're eight and three, but when you're three and eight and searching, that voice is important, and I've really appreciated his maturity and trying to pick up the young guys when they're hanging their heads. On most days, the way you played in the first half would have been good enough to take control of the game, but you couldn't break this one open. Thanks in large part to Virginia Tech 5'10 guard Jalen Cohn of the 47-inch vertical leap. He poured in a career-high 23 points in his previous game against Louisville off the bench, and he hit you guys with 14 in the first half before finishing with 18. Well, he's instant offense, and we recruited him some. You know, Coach Humphrey went down to see him, and we loved him. And 
Uh, he ended up going to Virginia Tech, staying in the South. But uh, he is so explosive, and he's a momentum changer quickly, the way he can shoot it and score it, and he can just jumpstart a team. And, and he did that a couple times in our game. Now, with the help of Cone, Tech was able to cut your lead to two with two and a half minutes left in the half. But you finished really strong on an 8-3 run, including threes by Goodwin and Ryan. And you took a seven-point lead into the locker room at halftime. And I know calling the game, I'm thinking, well, this is going to be a good afternoon. Yeah, you know, you go in and Scott Martin says, you know, really good line. He goes, well, that's the team I thought we could be. <laughs> and, and, and uh, uh, of course, we didn't see much of that team in the second half. So, you know, that's been our frustration, really. There's been signs, but we've not been able to against very good teams. Don't get me wrong. Um, we've just not been able to do that enough consistently. You know, I'm sure you've heard it your whole life. A lot of people say the only part of a basketball game that matters is the last two minutes of each half. Well, I've always thought the first two minutes of each half were pretty darn important. And Tech came out, scored the first eight points of the second half, and they took control of the game right then. Yeah, Jack, and I would agree with you. Um, starting a half is so important. And, you know, we turned it over twice, and they kind of really got out on us physically, and we were on our heels. And and then I thought it affected, it affected our defensive possessions. All of a sudden, our offense – that came so easy in the first half was hard and it affected how we digged into uh, dug in, excuse me, defensively. Um, and that, I think that's just a little bit of immaturity and not real confident. Offense was really hard. You ended up two for 19 from the floor in the half. You got out rebounded by 12, but you also emphasized to you guys every day in practice, regardless of what's going on, the free throw line is a weapon for us. If we earn it, and you did. You got to the line 20 times in the second half. You made 16, and that's why you were able to stay in it until the final minutes. Well, you know, that's the one thing we've been able to do. We've driven the ball and gotten fouled, and even against Virginia, we go 19 for 20 from the foul line. We're getting there, and we're scoring from there, but we're not efficient enough on either end in our regular flow, offensively or our defensive flow. We're just not efficient enough against – these very good teams. So after the 77-63 loss to Virginia Tech, you don't come home, you get a good night's sleep in Blacksburg, and then you head on up to Charlottesville for a rematch with a ranked Virginia team, and that pack line defense, always a challenge. But I thought it was Virginia coming out and shooting the lights out early, led by seven foot one at center Jay Huff, who could hit the three. He doesn't take many. He hit the first one of the game, ended up hitting a career high four in the first half. And I thought that really set the tone and gave Virginia control of the game. Well, I don't know if you get a good night's sleep in Blacksburg the way <laughs> the second half went, but you and I've been yeah. there before. And I've been down that road before. Having said that, yeah. um, yes, Virginia got off to such a great offensive start shooting the basketball a lot of them were deep shots um you know you want you know that the center shooting threes is something maybe you want to give up um but I don't know if we challenged enough of them now having said all that they're shooting well I thought our offense and our movement was really good and we got good looks and but when you don't make any of them and they make almost all of them in the first 10 minutes boy, are you digging out of a hole, which is what we had to do then the rest of the game. And the guy who kept you in it in the first half was the guy who made his looks because they were a lot closer to the basket, Jawan Durham. He had 10 points, four rebounds, and a couple of steals. And just as important as the points, you needed him. He's got a rebound. Some games he doesn't, this game he did. Well, we've challenged him to do that. I mean, I think that's an area where he can be better. And, and he and I talked about that um, actually in between the Virginia Tech and Virginia game. I said, you know, I'm going to put you back there and I'm not going to have you out chasing ball screens as much. If you're back in there, you, you got a rebound for us. And I think Nate has stuck his nose in there the most consistently rebounding wise. But we've not had another rebounder. Actually, Dane and Cormac maybe have been – our second best rebounders. And, and, you know, it's really telling when you lose a Mooney who just got everything. And now, you know, we're really struggling to do that against very good teams. But, but again, Jawan 
should get five, six, seven rebounds. He's playing enough minutes to do that, and and we we need him to do that. Another bright spot was the play of Trey Words coming off the sprained ankle. He was clearly still hobbled against Virginia Tech. You mentioned he still sore, but it looks like he's back to playing at 100%. He hit a bunch of tough shots, ended up with 13 points and four assists. He's a great combo guard for you. He just, you know, he's just a playmaking guard, and he made shots and scored. But I thought some of his passes and how he moved the ball, he understands how we play. And if you could get him, Cormac, and Prentice clicking, because they're three playmaking guards that all have the ability to score, if we could get those three clicking more consistently – I think we could be really fun, but we have not been able for a lot of different reasons to to find that yet. Now, as well as Virginia shot it in the first half, they shot it even better in the second half, 57%. Well, again, hitting 50% from three. They took a 24-point lead, but but here's where you kind of jumped on me politely in the post-game radio interview. No, 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 no. I want to talk about bright spots because maybe the biggest one was the way Cormac Ryan clicked better than he ever has in the second half of this game. He cut the lead down to 10 on a three-point play late in the game, finished with a team high, 16 points. He's never looked better for you on offense than he did in the second half against the best defense in the ACC. And and even though we weren't probably going to come back and win, um, for him to have some success offensively and see the ball go in, I think was really important. And it's funny. I turned to Rod Belanis and I said, has Cormac even scored yet? And we ran a little set. He knocked a three down like two seconds later. And, 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 uh, and then he got on a run. And, and so uh, again, I I think, I think he's turned down some good shots um, and, and, and dribbled a little too much at times. We want him to catch and shoot um, when he has just an okay window because he's got a great stroke. Uh, again, we, we need him to be uh, give us some offensive punch. And, and I'm hoping, you know, he found a, a flow, uh, as did Trey uh, in, in the game and, and Cormac in the second half. That's what I'm hoping we grab out of a tough afternoon in Charlottesville. We'll be back with more on the Mike Bray Show presented by TireRack.com right after this timeout. Recruited by John McLeod, David Graves was part of one of the most talented freshman classes in Notre Dame basketball history. He joined the Irish in 1998, along with fellow freshman Troy Murphy and Harold Swanigan, and helped lead the Irish to the 2001 Big East West title and consecutive trips to the NCAA tournament. Graves possessed a complete package of basketball skills with a great shot and a nose for the ball whether it was grabbing a rebound or picking an opponent's pocket. His 1,746 points remains 10th on Notre Dame's all-time scoring list, and his 41% accuracy from three-point land ranks 7th on the all-time list. David also averaged 4.8 rebounds, 2.6 assists, and 1.6 steals per game during his four-year Notre Dame career. He was a true stat sheet stuffer. This week, Coach Bray was able to catch up with David Graves. David Graves from Lexington, Kentucky. Man, it is great to catch up. The last time I saw you and your dad, we high-fived you running out of Rupp Arena uh, when we stole that one win and, and escaped and dodged the bullet uh, to get a win. Um, but um, I appreciate you joining us. And as we were talking before we got on, you know, uh, what people – I don't know if our fans really realize the impact you had on our program here. Um, You still are in the top 10 as an all-time scorer. I still say nobody's hit more big shots at key times than than you. Uh, And I was so fortunate, David. I was fortunate. I show up in South Bend. And I've got a bunch of veteran guys like you and Matt Carroll and Inglesby and Murphy and Humphrey and Swanigan. Um, I was really fortunate to have a group like you. But uh, certainly we, uh, we're proud of you. Uh, you're, you're a heck of a dad and a family man now. Uh, but give us a, catch us up a little bit on uh, life in Lexington with a beautiful family. 
Yeah, no, everything's good here. We've been we've been blessed. Like we talked about before this, uh, everybody's been healthy through this COVID, you know, madness. Uh, our kids have uh, been great. We've been pretty lucky. Our schools are in here. The Catholic private schools here uh, in Lexington are in. The public schools are in virtual. Um, so our, we've been blessed. We've been very lucky. Uh, our governor shut us down around Thanksgiving, probably as expected, but they got back January the 4th. I tell you, man, it's just, you know, for, for everybody's um, sense of, you know, what what are we going to do today? Kind of a purpose. It's getting everybody in a routine and it's been wonderful. I'm, I'm in coaching now. I, you know, I, I, one of my things, I think if you, I, I remember one of the conversations you and I had when I, when I graduated, you asked if I wanted to be a coach. And I said, you know, I don't think I do want to be a coach. You know, <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to get into the business world and kind of do some of those things. Well, fast forward 20 years from now. I'm now coaching uh, the Lexington Catholic fifth grade basketball team. Very proud of that. They're doing a great job and and my son's, you know, doing well. And, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm taking a lot of things that you've taught me and wrinkling it down to a bunch of 10 and 11 year olds. And I'll tell you what, it, it's amazing how they adapt to those kind of things. They're, they're doing a great job. Well, it's funny you mentioned coaching because you, you always had, you know, always had such a high basketball IQ you know, players like that make really good assistance. And I think for a while there, even after you graduated, you were still thinking about coming back. And I think I talked you out of it because I knew you'd watch, you'd make more money in business, uh, but you are getting your coaching fix now yes. as a hobby and not as, as a, believe me, a, as a main way of life, especially right now for me, it's probably better to be in business, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> Uh, and avoid it. But I love the fact that you're back teaching because you, you really were kind of a coach on the floor for us, you know, and, and uh, again, that group that we inherited, um, you know, it, 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 it's funny. You probably should have been gotten into the NSA tournament the year before I got here, Matt Doherty's year. You guys really had a good year. And, yeah. and I can remember watching the game at Ohio state early in the season, which was, Notre Dame's coming out party. You hit that big jump shot on the baseline to beat Ohio State at Ohio State, and kind of things get going. Um, yeah. But uh, talk a little bit about the guys. I mentioned a bunch of them. That group that was the first group. You know, you guys got us back to the tournament after a ten-year hiatus. That was a big step for our program. Yeah, it was. I mean, a lot of times, again, reflecting back 20 years, you kind of you know, think about some of the things, you know, people always ask me if you had it to do over again, would you go somewhere else? Would you go to Kentucky? Would you just, I would do exactly the same thing that we did. Uh, actually being a part of building the basketball program there at Notre Dame back to where, you know, it is today. Um, it, it was that that means more to me than, you know, most people can can understand, uh, you know, get our sophomore year when Matt came in, uh, you know, we had a great year and actually going to the NIT for us probably at that time was probably the best thing for us because we got to play in tournament uh, atmosphere, I think four or five more games, got to the finals of the NIT, lost to Wake Forest. Um, but for us, it, it took us into another nice step uh, when you came in, you know, our group, uh, as you can appreciate, you know, we kind of had to coach ourselves, you know, we had so much transition with, John McLeod after our freshman year. And then we kind of have to huddle with, with Tony Rolinski as our kind of our, our main compass. And then, you know, the thing with Matt came on and then the North Carolina deal, we were back in the same boat again. So it was, it was a familiar spot for us to be in uh, for me, Murph and Swanee, especially. And then we were able to help Matt and, and some of the younger guys that were a year behind us to kind of understand how this process works. So we kind of had a self-motivating group that kind of did our own thing and, and, and worked. Uh, T. Rowe was, a, was an unbelievable influence with us because he came in at the same time we came in. Um, right. And so he, right. He, was, he was amazing. And so we, we really, you know, uh, you know, you never wish to have three coaches in college, but, you know, I think we handled it pretty well as a group. And, uh, you know, having you there was just was, uh, was an amazing uh, – you know, amazing experience. I always tell everybody I, I'd love, I'd wish I could play for you for three years. Uh, yeah. but, but it was, it was a great two years and to get to the tournament with that group, it was really special. And then to see what's happened beyond to get the elite eight and win the ACC and some of those things that we, you know, we've, we've been cheering from a, from afar on has been fun to watch. But David, you know, you make a great point in that, you know, most mo kids should not experience three coaches in three years, but that's just <laughs> happened. 
and you end up having to kind of run yourself. And I know when I got there, you guys were so motivated to be an NSA tournament time. My worry was I just didn't want to screw you up. And, yeah, I remember and that. Stay first, out of your way. Just stay out of your way a little bit. But, uh, you know, you think back of how you were kind of the nucleus that built some momentum in the program when there was none. You used – I remember one day – after we played a game and we had a great crowd, maybe a sellout, you said, coach, you need to understand when I was a freshman and sophomore, we would watch film and you could hear our sneakers squeaking on the right. film over the TV, kind of like what we're playing in now, quite frankly. But, <laughs> but you, you know, I was like, wow, nobody came. And then what yeah. you did, what you guys did with the program, you kind of made us sexy and interesting and, and, and we won to get back to the tournament. So I'm always indebted to that group. And it's funny in Rupp arena where we saw you Swan and I talked about it. That was a little bit of a crossroads for us. Cause we got our butt kicked down there yep. mm -hmm. and you guys made a stand in the locker room to be better. It wasn't anything I did. It was you taking ownership and then we got, got rolling. I, I, I do you remember that locker room after that game? I do. I do. I remember, you know, it's it's similar to what you're dealing with now. It's, you know, I remember we started with, this was back when the Big East was going and we would start, if I, if I, they might get the dates mixed up, but we'd go like, you know, to Syracuse, we were, you know, to Miami. And then the alternate game was Kentucky. <laughs> and then we would have, you know, Boston College back or something like that when they were really good back then. And, you know, we'd kind of go at the beginning of the season, we'd kind of get you know, thumped a little bit and then we'd have a little gut check and then we'd go on these little epic eight, nine, 10 game runs. And, you know, winning the big East as a, as a, as a the junior year was a special moment uh, for not only for us individually, but for the program. Um, and that was pretty cool to, you know, to be with everybody in Blacksburg and have a big time down there. And it was fun. And, and then, you know, to just continue the success uh, that's happened from us. It's, it's been fun to watch. It really has been. And we, the, you know, we, we understand where we, where we are in the history of it, uh, I think as a group, and we're very proud, you know, to be, to be kind of the conduit there. Well, you're such great ambassadors too. You know, we were just in Blacksburg and even though the game didn't go yeah. well, I have great memories of that building because our win there clinched us the West division championship that day. You got us back to the NCAA tournament. And then I remember, you know, we were bringing you off the bench and we said, you know, we got to start Graves in the NSA tournament and then you don't miss a shot. And, and, uh, against Xavier, I think you were seven for seven in that game yeah. Yeah. and propelled us not only first time in the tournament in 10 years, but you get a tournament win over a good program. And we couldn't quite get over the hump against Ole Miss. Um, but, uh, you know, we still have Swan here with us, and he, he's he got – and Hump, they, they go back to that day and tell a lot of real good stories uh, of uh, of you guys back in the day when the Joy Center had green and yellow and purple seats. Yep. And the pit, the pit was all we had. Maybe we're a little spoiled now, quite frankly. <laughs> Well, it's a, it's certainly a different environment than when we when we were there. I remember on a, uh, Swanee and I were laughing on our recruiting visit. They wouldn't take me to the men's locker room, uh, yeah. and because we were right where we are today. But you know, it was not anything near what it is today. And it was kind of funny. They said they were doing some electric work in there, and so they they wouldn't let me in there. But you know, it was it was uh, like I tell I tell everybody all the time, and I say it to this day. If I if I, my body would let me do it again, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Uh, it's just, you know, now that you're 41 years old and, you know, knees, knees hurt a little bit, your hips, it's a young man's game for sure. But what a great experience that, you know, I had personally and, and I and to do it with my brothers, Harold and Ryan and Murph and Matt and, you know, all those guys, we were a real close bunch. We challenged each other um, on occasion and, and we made each other better. I mean, I think you have to kind of have that as a group. You got to, you got to be able to challenge yourself in the right way. Uh, and, and make each other accountable for each other. And, you know, those things happen, and, you know, we, we've had some success with it. You all became men, and, and that's what yeah. we're trying to do with this current group, grow them up and, and, and uh, get them tougher. Um, but, uh, no, your group, and, and I, now I love when you come back, you come back to campus and you're with your family, and, you know, when, you, when you've had, I think I've had 55 guys go through now in 20 years. Yeah. And when you guys come back with your families and different phases of your life, I'm, I'm just so proud, you know, of the young men we've had. I mean, it's just been unbelievable. The great guys 
that right. have come through this program and you all stick <clears> together <throat> and 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 I want you to know we're uh, we're really really proud of you and and uh, um, I, I want you to I'll sign off by saying uh, please tell your dad I said hello nobody loves hoops more than your dad he's still sending me emails on guys in Kentucky that we yeah. should recruit I love them to death um, and I tell you what if uh, we had an all time who takes the key shot team. I don't know if anybody would get more votes than you, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, it's funny. You, you, everybody remembers the one you make, but uh, you got to understand there's there's a lot of them you miss too, but you got to have the, uh, I guess, the stones in order to get there and, and knock it down. So, but, you know, again, my teammates got me in some good positions. I was able to make a few key shots. And um, again, it was, a, it was just a, a great experience personally. And, uh, you know, I loved everything, every minute of it there. Uh, again, I, I wish I had played with you for more than two years. And I love the way these guys play now. Hell, I, I mean, I think I only averaged maybe four threes a game, maybe three threes a game. With this group, I, I could have been 10, 12, 14. Oh. Who knows? Who Man, knows? <laughs> Dave, the looks you would have gotten, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but, uh, look, I, uh, stay safe. Hello to the family. Likewise. Hello to dad and mom and everybody. And, uh have fun coaching those kids up, coaching your son up. When you coach your son, make sure he gets the most shots. That's the one <laughs> bit of advice uh, I would give you. Well, he's 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 uh he's better than most right now at his age, so that's pretty good. I, I'm I'm proud of him. He's doing a great job. I want him to enjoy his experience, not my experience. There I had go. mine. I want him to enjoy his, and whether it's basketball or baseball or band or whatever it might be we'll, we'll embrace him and and uh and so we're proud of him he's doing a great job well you're a great dad and and we miss you buddy stay uh stay in touch stay cool. safe and uh we'll catch up with you and, and hopefully when this campus opens up soon we'll get you back up here for a football weekend where we can hang out yeah swanee and i were talking uh this year i think it's gonna be a good year to bring some kids up hopefully camp goes on and we can get up That'd there for camp and and uh, get up there and, and, and kind of spend a week together your son to camp would be it. All right. Happy New Year and stay safe and go Irish, David. Go Irish. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate See you. See you, buddy. Take care, Bye -bye. my man. Hey, Notre Dame fans. Tire Rack is the presenting sponsor of the Mike Bray Show. And like the Irish, they know a thing or two about passion and performance. Their on-site test track is their home court, and they've got a playbook that includes safe, no contact mobile installation in many areas. Get your tires right at TireRack.com, the way tire buying should be. Our friends at Tire Rack also sponsor our weekly player interview. And joining us now is Irish junior guard Cormac Ryan. Cormac is in his second year with the Irish after transferring from Stanford. And this is his first year playing in games for Notre Dame. It was a pretty good week for Cormac, 26 points against Virginia Tech in Virginia with 11 rebounds, four assists, and three steals. And, Mike, I know you really liked what you saw from Cormac in the second half against Virginia when he scored all of his season-high 16 points. Well, the one thing about, about him is he is a competitor, and, and really, in a lot of ways, he's been our best perimeter defender consistently. And I think then he's been trying to find his offensive flow, and I thought – down the stretch of the Virginia game, it started to kind of feel comfortable to him. There was going to be a growth period with him, no question about it. He he didn't play all last year, and we've thrown him in there against great competition. But uh, the one thing about him, he plays with a great edge and, and toughness. And to see that offensive rhythm come, uh, I think, is going to be important for us moving forward. Carmack, welcome to the Mike Bray Show. What's been the biggest adjustment from going to just playing and leading in practice to getting back on the floor in games in the ACC? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of like what Coach said, just finding rhythm um, and just continuing to be aggressive, um, you know, no matter what's going on in the game. Um, you know, I think continuing to rely on, you know, my teammates and, trying to make the right play at all times and just trusting, you know, my instincts and, you know, the, the chemistry that we have on this team is, is good and is, is a big part of it. And so I think just continuing to trust in that and, and our abilities, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of carry it. Michael, you always talk about the importance of being a good fit 
at Notre Dame. And when Cormac decided he wanted to transfer, I know this was a no-brainer because it was actually the second time you recruited him. So what did you see in Cormac both times the opportunity came up to have him play for Notre Dame? Well, we always felt he would be a great fit here, but I don't think it was as good a fit as far as playing time coming out of high school. And and to his credit, I, I understood that. Now it comes a year later and Gibbs and Pfluger are now leaving the building, you know, and, and he's doing the year in residency. It, it was perfect timing. And, and certainly um, he's a, a fabulous student uh, in our Mendoza school. He's absolutely crutching it academically that's all he's ever done in his life and and then our style of play I think was really good for him and 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 an opportunity to be on the floor long minutes I think I wore him out a little bit playing him 37 minutes at times earlier in the season but now he's kind of got accustomed to playing long minutes I think that's a shock to all our guards system when we first throw him into it and certainly, Cormac, coming out of high school, even players are a little bit of a question mark because you haven't played at a high level. But you were a starter at Stanford, and you had a lot of choices. People had seen for sure what you could do. Butler, Davidson, Gonzaga, Marquette, Northwestern Penn, Texas, Villanova, Virginia, Yale. Boy, you had a lot of choices. Why'd you pick Notre Dame? Um, you know, I think it was, like you said, I think it was a kind of a no-brainer. I think the style of play, um, the culture of the team that I got a sense from talking to the guys and also just being on campus and talking with coach and the staff. Um, you know, it just seemed like it was a real family culture. Um, and that was kind of what I was looking for. Um, and then in addition, like, you know, obviously it's a great academic school and, and the style of play is something that I think fit my game and, you know, was uh, made, made the decision pretty easy. You know, Mike, before COVID, I was at practice almost as much as your managers. <laughs> And last year, I have never seen a player who wasn't playing for an entire season in games have a bigger impact on a team than Cormac did. What was your reaction when you saw the way he immediately stepped into a leadership role that's difficult for a lot of guys to do even when they're playing heavy minutes? Well, you bring up a great point, Jack. You know, I, I've never had – we've had transfers who sit out. I've never had a guy so engaged – you know, trying to lead and help and encourage. And I think that's why he was voted a captain this year. You know, he had not even played a minute for us and yet his teammates voted him a captain. So it kind of tells you how pure he is and, and how he is uh, uh, seen by his teammates. It's never happened. So I think that's really a, a credit to him. Uh, and, and he continues to do that uh, now that he is in uniform and helping us. I know, Cormac, I'm going to surmise that, that one of the things you've been battling with this year is yourself because you feel such a tremendous sense of obligation and responsibility to your teammates, not only to contribute at a high level, but to bring them along with you. So, so tell me what needs to happen to have at least two of the guards on the floor have big games every night, which is what this team needs. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, a large part of it is just um, continuing to play like our style of basketball. Um, that's kind of been our focus is just to play the way we know how we can play. Um, we all know that we're a really capable group. Um, and like you like you said, when when we're firing on all cylinders, we're, we're a very tough team to deal with. Um, so I think continuing to focus defensively first on, you know, getting stops and playing team defense. And then, you know, on offense, just trusting the way we know how to play. We see it every day in practice. Um, we've seen flashes of it this year. And when we have, it's been excellent. So I think continuing to talk and communicate, um, trust each other, encourage each other, pick each other up when, when they're down. Um, and, and, you know, just continue to do what we know we can do. Um, and, and I think that will uh, be encouraging for, one guy and then the next and then the next and it's contagious. And then, you know, from there, I think we'll find a, a nice groove and a nice rhythm. And, you know, that'll that'll carry hopefully throughout the end of the season. You know, it, this probably makes sense that because Cormac has leadership qualities like Pat Connaughton did, should be no surprise that Cormac also played for the Middlesex Magic AAU team, the same one that Pat Connaughton did. Did those two guys, have they kind of set up a uh, New England pipeline to Notre Dame right now? 
Well, I hope so. There's no question. And nobody's prouder and Cormac knows this than Mike Crotty, uh, you know, that uh, Pat Cotton came out here and had a heck of a career. And, and, and Mike was very excited when we were able to get Cormac and, and was very supportive uh, of, of this being the choice for Cormac. So um, it's a neat program, um, tough kids who know how to play. Uh, it's always interesting to watch that AAU team pro play, even though I haven't watched much AAU basketball in a year with the pandemic. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'd love to keep going. New England's been good to us, you know, Bonzi, Zach August, Cormac, Pat, you know, New England's lately has been very good to us. Now, Cormac, Fans forget sometimes, even diehard Notre Dame fans, that you're more than just players. If you're at Notre Dame, you are truly a student athlete, as you are at Stanford. So I know you're in the Mendoza College of Business. You're majoring in management consulting. How important was that opportunity to your decision to come to Notre Dame? It was definitely important. Um, you know, I think the the transfer opportunity was definitely largely a basketball decision. Um, so I think that. Um, that was my primary focus was finding a, a spot that, you know, was a, a really good basketball fit. Um, but, you know, the academic piece did factor into it. And obviously Notre Dame's a great school. Um, and so being able to kind of study in the Mendoza School of Business and, and you know, work towards getting a, a degree there has been uh, a great opportunity. So I think that, you know, the, the fit, as we say, both on and off the court has been great. Now, Mike, I know things are tough for this club right now, but I've been with you your entire tenure here. And I was thinking back last night, I think it was 2009, you'd lost seven in a row. Things look dire. You end up getting on a roll and you get to the NIT championship game. So what does this team need to do to turn this around? And you mentioned to me, Cormac has to play a big role in this. What does he need to do to help that happen? You know, it's funny you mentioned, you know, being at the crossroads. And I, I think I've been there a, a number of times through my career here. Last year's team was at a crossroads. This group experienced two and six in the ACC coming out of Florida State. Now, I am not going to yell at the refs and get a $20,000 fine <laughs> to jumpstart a run like last year. I, I can't afford to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we got a neat group of guys that have each other's back. And the Boston College Howard stretch becomes really important for us. You know, if you could get those two in three days, all of a sudden your food tastes different. The, the, it's brighter every day, even though we don't see the sun much here in South Bend through the winter and, and, and things start to change. But our, our guards, Cormac, Prentice, Trey, Dane, they are a key for us and we want them to be aggressive and, get into a rhythm, and then guard like heck on the other end. Cormac, uh, one of the reasons folks love Coach Bray's show is not just his wonderful personality, but the fact that all Notre Dame's plays, you guys are really interesting. You had diverse backgrounds, and one way we dig into that is with our fast break question. So you did well last year. Uh, this is year two for you, and we're going to begin with first car you ever drove. Uh, the first car I ever drove was probably my, my mom's car, which was like a, uh, like a Jeep Grand Cherokee. Favorite all time movie. Goodfellas. Who was your role model? My dad. One thing the public would be surprised to learn about you. Um, I can do a uh, couple card tricks. Really? Yeah. Should have had you bring cards. <laughs> favorite NBA player favorite NBA player uh, of all time or currently 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 I'd probably say Devin Booker all time Steve Nash best part of your game um probably be my competitiveness part of your game you need to work on um being aggressive City or place in the world you would like to visit? Um, Australia. Which is better, knocking down a long three, dishing out a terrific pass, or coming up with a big steal? Mm, 
Depends on the time and score, man. <laughs> now that's a cerebral player. I Good like answer. that answer. Good answer. One thing you always hear from Coach Bray in practice. Um, it's a good one. Uh, I would say he he would uh, after like a great possession, he'd go, he'd go, you know, some something along the lines of like, wow, you know, like, is this us? Like, is this us? Like, is this what we do? This is us, right? You know, <laughs> something like that. Mike, I could see him filtering because there's a lot of things you do say in practice that he can't say on the radio. So he, he was very good at doing that. Assistant coach who was most like Coach Bray. That's a good uh, it's, it's a tough one. I, I think they're all pretty unique in their own way. I would say, you know, maybe Coach B. Yeah. Mike, we're back to that. We got away with it for a couple of years, but yeah, yeah. Coach Bolanis, no question pleasure. about that. Player on the team most like you, Cormac? Most like me? Yeah. Probably maybe Elijah Morgan. Player on the team who will surprise fans the most this season? Uh, I think Nick Jogo. I like that answer. Best defender on the team? I would have to say myself, just because if I didn't, I'd beat myself up about it. <laughs> Toughest Notre Dame player to guard? Uh, right now, it's my guy, Nate. Best leaper on the team? Um, sneakily, Tony Sanders. Ooh. Best dunker on the team? Juwan. Worst dunker on the team? Elijah, I don't know if he can dunk. <laughs> Best dresser on the team. Uh, that's a good one. I I I go. Uh, I'll go with Nick. Nick Jogo. I mean, with the pandemic, it's hard to tell because nobody gets dressed up anymore. So exactly. That's a tough question. How about the worst dresser, even casual on the team? <laughs> uh. I would say I, I got I to gotta go with Matt, Matt Zona. <laughs> Best singer on the team? Tony. Worst singer on the team? Tony. <laughs> Best comedian on the team? Uh, probably Elijah Morgan. Guy who thinks he's funny, but he's really not. <laughs> um, probably Bob, Robbie. And final question, free throw shooting competition. Who wins, you or Coach Bray? <laughs> Coach did hit one the other day in practice, I got to say, but I, I I would have to go with myself, hopefully. I hope so, too. Cormac, great job. Thank you for the time today. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Cormac. We'll be back with more on the Mike Bray Show right after this timeout. Welcome back to the Mike Bray Show. Mike, looking at the schedule, some would think it gets a little easier this weekend, but your opponent at Purcell on Saturday, Boston College, is playing well. They recently lost by just one at Duke, and they're coming off a 22-point home win over Miami in which they hit 18 threes. Yeah, there's, um, they're coming in hot. There's no question about it. And our games with them are always – good and right to the wire. Um, so an offensive group, this is a skilled team that can really shoot it. And we've had a hard time getting out and being attention to detail enough on clean shooting. So we're going to have to get better before we see the Eagles. Then it's on to Washington DC to play a Howard Bison squad. That is one and four, but a bit of a mystery to get ready for is they've not played since early December, an 81-76 win over Hampton because their last three games have been canceled or postponed because of COVID-19. But they do feature highly prized recruit 6'11", McCore Maker from Australia. Well, Jack, and this will sound crazy, but it may be the most important game on our schedule for the big picture reasons. We decided to do this game along with Howard back in June when 
the social injustice movement was at an all-time high. It, it's funny how it's even at another all-time high, given everything that's happened. And we got involved with the When We All Vote initiative, along with the Howard players, to kind of see if we could make a difference. Our kids could have some impact. And this is kind of the culmination of it. Now we're going to play the game. And uh, we're thrilled to be there. Obviously, Power 5 teams don't play at HBCU campuses, but we will. And we're honored to be there. And uh, certainly Kenny Blakeney, uh, the coach, young man I recruited to Duke, is the, is the, is the coach there. Um, but uh, it, it, it's a game we want to win, don't get me wrong. But there's, there were there on MLK Day. There's a lot of things from an educational standpoint for my students that I think will be lasting for them. And as if that were not important enough for you, a guy who considers his players to be like sons, you get to reunite with one of your many sons, Eric Atkins, an assistant coach for Howard. Well, not only is Eric Atkins on the staff, but Thomas Hill is also on the staff, a young man I recruited to Duke along with Kenny. So uh, it'll be neat to see the three of them there uh, uh, on Monday. Folks, that will do it for this week's edition of the Mike Bray Show, but we will return at this time next week to break down all the latest news about Mike Bray's Fighting Irish. So until next week for Coach Bray, I'm Jack Nolan. Stay safe, everybody, and as always, go Irish.